spectroscopy very generally said is the study of how light of any wavelengths is interacting with matter, with materials. And this can be molecules, can be atoms, it can be materials, nanoparticles, quantum dots, you name it. And typically what is done in spectroscopy is you pick a wavelength of light. It can be visible as we have it all around us all the time, but it could be x-ray as it is for instance now and when you go to get an x-ray scan with a broken bone, or it can be microwave as you know it from the kitchen. So depending on what you want to learn about your material, about your molecules, you use these different types of light. And then in spectroscopy, you study how these materials and molecules are interacting with this specific type of light in order to learn more about them. When we look at light uh, with our eyes, we're actually seeing a spectrum of different wavelengths of light. And it's actually a, a relatively narrow range. Even though we see a variety of colors all the way from red to violet, that's a very, very narrow range of the wavelengths of light which can exist uh, in the universe. And so there is a, a vast electromagnetic spectrum uh, of light which uh, we also can use to, to look at the universe. But in, in particular, what we try to do with spectroscopy is understand how matter interacts with that light and leaves its footprints on this spectrum. Spectroscopy is uh, the study of uh, matter in general. This could be any form of matter, uh, gases, atoms, molecules, uh, solids. And it is by means of uh, radiation, and the radiation is used either incoming as a finger to get a fingerprint of the material, or looking at the outgoing uh, radiation from the sample, as we call it, or the material under investigation, and extracting information um, about the system. This can be very different information. This can be about the magnetism. This can be about the structure. This can be about the functioning, about the chemical bonding, um, about the catalytic activity. The bottom line is if you add any parameters or any qual qualifiers to this, uh, this would be likely also could be covered with spectroscopy and unraveled. So very often what we are looking in spectroscopy is like how sensitive is the spectrometer, how good is the resolution, that means um, how fine of changes can, are you actually able to detect, or like um, depending on in particular what we are doing, when we are looking at how our materials are emitting some light, so they glow if you want, after they have interacted with the other type of light, then we also need a detector, or you always need a detector at the other end. So over time, these detectors became better and better. And of course, this opens whole new fields then for researchers to explore more details, smaller scales, faster processes, you name it. If we want to look back in history, how old spectroscopy is and for how long it has been used as a tool, I would guess it really started already before Hertzberg. So there was, for instance, the invention of like interferometers that was like the basics of spectroscopy. But then in modern worlds, it really um, got like more and more popular with Hertzberg. He was like really like being involved and he said this in one of the texts that I found about him. He said like it was amazing because he was working on these things while they were developed. And some of the really basic fundamental concepts that we have in our chemistry understanding, but also spectroscopy then grow. So a hundred years is probably fair to say that people are using it. Hertzberg was a spectroscopist and at the very early days he was uh, looking at atoms, but um, then fairly quickly in his earlier career shifted to spectroscopy of molecules, um, uh, which is in a sense more challenging and at that time was a very new field. The molecules that Hertzberg studied were almost always in the gas phase, so that you were actually looking at the molecule itself um, rather than the molecule itself plus its interaction with everything else, which is what happens if you're looking in the liquid or solid phase spectroscopy. So in the gas phase, you're looking at molecules by analyzing the light that they give off or the light that is absorbed if it passes through 
the gas of molecules. And that light can be visible light, but it can also be the light that we, we can't see in the ultraviolet range, for example, which is higher energy light than, than humans can see, or in the infrared range, which is lower energy light that humans also can't see. And what you do with the light that a spectroscopist is analyzing is to split it up into its different colors or wavelengths, uh, just as you see in a, in a rainbow. So for example, if you pass light through a, a glass prism, you can split it into its different colors. And which colors come through the molecules and which ones are absorbed or which uh, colors are given off or emitted by the molecules. That's what a spectroscopist works with, is this fingerprint of absorption or emission of light by the molecules. And by analyzing that pattern of light that's absorbed or emitted, you can find out a lot of details about the molecule itself. For example, um, what's the shape of the molecule? We know that water is, has the chemical formula H2O, but where is the H and where are the O's and how far apart are the O's and H's and what angle do you have between the, the, the different bonds? So that's the information that you get from analyzing the spectroscopy. He did a variety of research uh, in the earlier days, but fairly quickly moved on to a special interest in unstable molecules or free radicals, which are more challenging to study than ordinary molecules because these free radicals only live for a short time under most circumstances. But they're very important because free radicals are, in a sense, the intermediates in chemical reactions. If you have a reaction of two molecules that then goes through to create two other molecules, like happens if you have a, a fire, for example, you've got things burning and using up oxygen and new molecules are being created. And so these short-lived intermediate molecules are important for chemistry and they're very interesting for spectroscopy because number one, they're challenging because usually they, these radicals don't live for very long so that they're, it's harder to capture their spectra. And number two, they're interesting just in their own right because often we don't really know what the, the exact structure of a free radical is gonna be and doing spectroscopy um, will tell you the structure. So free radicals are actually molecules that have like some single electrons. You can imagine that usually electrons always want to be in pairs, but then if there is one that is lonely, this is typically what is considered as, an, as a radical. And he was one of the first who was able to identify some of these radicals. So again, it was like a very important fundamental study that helped chemists to understand how these radicals are actually working at, a, at an atomistic level. Hertzberg's fame, in a way, uh, famous scientific work, came from trying to discover these elusive free radicals. For example, CH2, one carbon and two hydrogens, which he pursued for many years. And after some false starts, uh, he, he found the spectrum. And uh, that was one of the most important aspects, I think, that, that won him the Nobel Prize. How does a spectroscopy apply to astronomy? Well, let me tell you. So most of astronomy uh, occurs basically from the vantage point of the Earth, uh, either telescopes from the ground or orbiting the Earth. And so we are actually peering out into the universe, a universe that we, that is so huge, we cannot travel to uh, visit and sample ourselves. So we are, are left with 
whatever means we can to 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 perceive and understand the universe um, as best we can. And the primary way in which astronomy has been able to do that is through light. So stars emit light, the sun emits light, um, the planets reflect light, um, and uh, all sorts of, when we look at the galaxies, we're looking at the, the sum total of all of the light from its stars and so forth. So there's no way we're going to be able to, to travel to a galaxy. They're just too far away and it would take uh, millions of years to, to travel that way at the fastest speeds. So we're left to using this messenger of light as a way of trying to understand the universe, okay? So spectroscopy has been an extremely powerful technique in, in actually becoming, or actually enabling us to understand the universe. And in fact, uh, it was the rise of spectroscopy in the late 19th century that changed the subject of astronomy into astrophysics. Because before, astronomy was, try was basically trying to, to, to look at what was in the universe, and astrophysics is more of trying to understand how the universe works. And this tool of spectroscopy, because of its ability uh, to trace the elements and of atoms and the molecules that exist in the universe and the subtleties in which the, that matter affects the light enables us to, to probe the conditions of what's going on in the universe in, in a very interesting way. And people have been extremely clever in using uh, the subtleties that, that we see in these slight differences in intensities uh, with wavelength to be able to understand a tremendous amount about, um, about the universe. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of amazing when you think about it, how this, because we, we, we simply can't go to these places, we are left trying to decode the information that's uh, within light by splitting it up into its component uh, wavelengths and then trying to understand those, those slight differences in, in brightness uh, with wavelength because of the influence of, of, of molecules and atoms uh, on that spectrum. And so we actually do use uh, molecular spectroscopy ourselves to understand how it is that uh, stars themselves form. In my research group, we are actually focusing on um, materials chemistry and also nanophotonics. So that means we are trying to synthesize really, really small nanoparticles that is like tiny at the nanometer scale. And um, so in that regard, we are on the chemistry side, but then these materials that we are preparing, they are having very interesting optical properties. And in this respect, we are actually looking into spectroscopy. Right now, we are sitting actually in my research group's optics lab. And as you can see here, all the equipment and this big part is actually a spectrometer. So spectroscopy is really the second foot of the research that we are doing. The first one is material synthesis, but once we have synthesized our materials and we did some basic structural characterization like size and shape, we come here and we look at the optical properties and all this is actually photoluminescence spectroscopy. So more specifically with these materials, we are working particularly with lanthanide or with rare earth doped nanomaterials. Those are for those of you that are familiar with the periodical table and you have all the elements and there are these few double lines that are like pushed out, ignored by so many. Those are the elements of our heart. We really love them. And that's actually because of their very interesting optical and also magnetic properties. So that's our specialty. Yeah, we do actually exclusively spectroscopy. So this means we use these modern light sources like synchrotrons, and namely the Canadian light source here on campus. And we use also other synchrotrons sometimes. And um, we use these techniques uh, called absorption and emission spectroscopy and inelastic scattering. These are all different techniques. And we use them to extract what I call a fingerprint of the material. And this fingerprint will help us to unravel a certain question. This could be how to make a better lighting materials, which is one area which, we, uh, which we, my group works in. You have to always look at how do you dissect uh, the uh, radiation coming from the system or the absorption. How do you dissect it by energy or wavelength? And you do this exactly with what's called spectrographs at the time, or spectrometers, we call it. 
nowadays, and uh, I use today, and my group uses the fraction gradients, um, and so did uh, Herzberg. It's just he did it a little di with different parameters for the optical range, and we do it now for the soft X-rays. But basically, the principle how you uh, look at the photons of the radiation coming out, we do it in the same way. The only nifty thing that we have today that wasn't at his, uh, didn't exist at his time are, of course, the synchrotrons. So while Herzberg was looking at the radiation coming, say, from uh, methylene or some free radicals and looked at the absorption of this, we do basically the same thing with the synchrotron. The only new thing is we have a much, much better and more powerful and also, of course, more expensive and more sophisticated source for the experiment. We have a synchrotron. He had to use uh, basically a white light uh, source. This could be to find uh, less corrosive materials. This could be to find a uh, new material that has new properties that haven't existed before, say superconductivity or things like that. So the, the, the uh, range of application is basically limitless.